chapter 15. Or at least we're going to be there. Perhaps to say we're in there is a little premature. Air conditioner's working. No one turned the air conditioner down on the front one here this morning. And it was pretty stuffy by the time the service was over this morning. So, I fixed it. <laughs> Are they comfortable? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's cold? Okay, I'll turn it up for you. I'm comfortable. <laughs> and that's fine. Hey, she's, she's got to let you put her arm, or your arm around her, right? It's cold like that. You can get cozy when you're married. So, that's a trick. Just a tip for you guys. Plan on being married someday. Meh. <laughs> well, hey. It's only good to those that want it. Chapter 15, you there? We'll go down to verse 10. And I, and I think we, most of us know this story, but there's some important lessons for us to be reminded about. In verse 10 of chapter 15, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And uh, when Samuel rose early to meet Paul in the morning, Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And then we'll jump down to verse 23. Uh, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. So, Father, I pray that you would help us as we look at the Scripture this evening and we look at the consequences for sin. And then, God, the way that we ought to respond when we're given consequences, I pray that you would help us to glean wisdom and to, to learn the right response. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Humanly speaking, Saul is completely relatable. Isn't he? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have some experience. Uh, I have... Um, been growing spiritually for a long time, I don't think I'd offer a sacrifice. I'm not saying that. I don't think I'd have the gall to do something that God had uh, really only had a few people that were supposed to do. Just knowing God and knowing the seriousness of spiritual things, to take it on yourself to offer a sacrifice, I wouldn't have done. But I certainly can understand Saul's conundrum, can't you? I mean, literally hundreds of thousands of Philistines surrounding you. You've got a few thousand uh, Israelites who are scared to death and they're deserting and they're hiding and running away and Samuel isn't showing up. And so what do you do? Well, Saul felt like he had to do something. And so he offered the sacrifice. He felt like that would, uh, I guess that would rally the troops or that would help people gain confidence in him. It would keep them from running away because it seemed as though uh, Samuel wasn't going to show up and it seemed as though he was going to lose his military. Do you know if Saul were familiar with the judges? Do you think he was? He would have been familiar with the period of the judges in Israel, being that he was the first king and they're coming off the period of the judges. You know, God was able to give a pretty significant victory to Gideon with not very many people. That's interesting, isn't it? You ever ask the question, what would I do in Saul's circumstance? Uh, you know, the first lesson we learned from Saul is don't ever put God in an either or. Don't ever propose to God, God, shall I or shall I? Because it may be that God has something altogether different. And Saul's situation was, I have to do something. But you don't have to do something God didn't tell you to do. Many times, humanly speaking, we respond to circumstances as though God couldn't do something outside of 
what our what our ability to comprehend is or outside of what our knowledge is. And you know, God's just not limited in any way. And he would not have been limited for King Saul. And you say, Pastor, what would God have done in that circumstance? Well, I think God would have had things handled. If he gave Israel Saul for a king, he could have given Saul the victory as he had at other times. Previous to chapter 15, if you were read, you'd read the account of Jonathan and the way that God used Jonathan and his armor bearer to win a great victory, but Saul had said, no eating, and Jonathan didn't know that, and so he put his, what is it, his spear into the honeycomb, and he'd taken out some honey and eaten honey, and so then Saul found out about it and decided that Jonathan was going to die for it. And the children of Israel said in uh, chapter 14, verse 45, the people said unto Saul, shall Jonathan die who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid. As the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he hath wrought with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, that he died not. And so what we find is Saul is literally going crazy. Uh, I don't know how else to put it, but the evil spirit that troubles Saul is much like the evil spirit that troubles people who are crazy, who are out of their mind, out of their head. And I, I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to overstate, oversimplify, but I want to propose thoughts that I hope will help you. If you study, do a case study of Saul, uh, he has all the symptoms of people today, doesn't he, that have some of our common um, mental diagnosis, mental problems? Could we say Saul was probably bipolar? Mm -hmm. I mean, he just he fits the description, doesn't he, of a guy that's bipolar? And you say, Pastor, well, if that's the case, then you know God made him that way. Well, you know, it, it occurred to me some years ago that people's mental issues, they're real, aren't they? And they really have real problems. But you know, every circumstance that God makes you in, He also gives you the ability to escape. Every situation that you have is something that God can give you victory over. And the notion that Saul had no choice, Saul had no... Uh, you know, he just, he was a victim of the way that it seemed like he just went crazy. I mean, he, on the one hand, he's this humble guy. On the other hand, he's this ridiculously arrogant guy. And they're two people. You know, you're going to have a hard time determining what's sin and what's what are thoughts. And really what makes the difference is when you act oftentimes on thoughts. And King Saul, King Saul could have had God's help. And so can any person. God hasn't put you in or given you a circumstance that with the help of His Holy Spirit you cannot have victory. You say, Pastor, that's oversimplification. No. No, the fact is is that you cannot look at your life and look at your circumstances or the things that you feel or the things that you deal with and use them for an excuse to behave in a way uh, that it is sin. And so it may be that it's more of a struggle for you. Might it be that there are some here who legitimately have more difficulty controlling their temper? than others. You say, Pastor, it's lack of discipline. Well, whatever it is, some people it's a real struggle. Does it make it okay nope. to lose your temper? Nope. No. You just need God's help more than other people do. Might it be that uh, some have trouble with struggles of the flesh, addictions, or things like that, uh, to a degree that others don't even know about? And the answer is absolutely, but God's given a way of escape. And that's through His Spirit. Galatians 5 says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not obey the lust of the flesh. And what we see is Saul beginning to really rely on the flesh. Uh, he is contrasted by Samuel as having seen himself as little in his own sight, and now he no longer sees himself as little in his own sight. He sees himself as king of Israel and with the rights of a king. And he's proposing the death of his son for something his son could not have known about. It was completely innocent of in his mind. He's irrational, isn't he? What we're going to see this evening is Saul's response and what God calls rebellion. And it, it, there's a lot to learn from it, a lot to, to glean from it. Saul is given the command to, to destroy the Amalekites and uh, God's word on it is that he is not to keep anything. He's not to keep the oxen. He's not to keep the sheep. 
He's not to. He's to, supposed to utterly destroy them. And so what's what it's all do? Well, he decided to keep the best of the sheep and the oxen, and he kept King Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And we know that story. I think it's one of the uh, well-known stories. We're not going to read our way through it this evening. But God knows everything, and God had told Samuel there's a problem, and that's where we're at in verse 11. If God said, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he's turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Now, why does the Holy Spirit include this account about Samuel? Well, I think it's because it's important for us to understand this is not a grudge between the former judge and the king. This is not Samuel saying, well, you know what, we asked for a king, and now I'm, I'm vindicated, I'm validated, and we're going to go back to the times. No, the fact is, is that Samuel loved Saul, and the Scripture indicates that he cried all night. Don't cry tears for someone you don't love or for someone that you're against. And that does make Samuel's rebuke of Saul all the more notable, doesn't it? The truth is, is that if Samuel dislikes Saul or resented him for being king or hadn't accepted that this is what God is, has given the children of Israel, this is, this is what God is going to use, then he could have responded very differently. But the scripture vindicates Samuel. And it's not jealousy, it's not envy uh, that Samuel has here. It is literally Samuel being broken hearted over an individual that has changed for the worse. Saul's a very different man than the man who was anointed to be king over Israel. Again, we're reminded in this transition period between the judges and the kings that people change. And sometimes people change for the better, and sometimes people change for the worse. And Saul is an example of one who changed for the worse. And while we're discussing it, how about David? If you were to ask me who was the worst individual, I'll be honest with you, my bias in many cases would be against David more so than Saul. I mean, David was a murderer and an adulterer. And yet, God established his throne. Allowed his throne to be established and didn't reject him from being king. And when you look at those contrasts, then you have to ask yourself the question, what was so terrible about what Saul did? Was it because of the spiritual disregard that he had? And I think that the answer would be somewhere in there. That he's willing to offer a sacrifice, which David wouldn't have done. When David offered a sacrifice, he was commanded to. For instance, when he bought, purchased Arana's threshing floor and offered a sacrifice. And so it would be different in the attitude. David would have offered a sacrifice for himself, not as a representative or as a priest. Saul has become very presumptuous, very proud, and utterly unreasonable. And that's what we're like when we're in the flesh, truthfully. Uh, listen, I, when, it, when, when I'm not in fellowship with the Lord, uh, I'm just a lousy person. I'm just a rotten person, capable. You know, it's, it's incredible, isn't it? When we pray and say, like the psalmist, search me, show me my heart, show me if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of life everlasting. Isn't it incredible what God will show you when you pray that? Lead me in the way of life everlasting. I mean, God just says, you know, here's, some, here's a motive. Here's something you're doing, and you think you're all self-righteous, and you think you're doing the right thing, but here's really why you're doing it. You ever done a good thing for the wrong reason? Man, the Holy Spirit will put His finger right on something like that, won't He? And we're just capable of a lot of things. In our pride and our arrogance, we get out of fellowship with the Lord. We lack the humility. That's what Saul has. He has a total lack of humility. He has an utter disregard for the leading of God's Spirit. And he needs the Spirit of God. You can't, you can't lead a people like Israel without God's help, without God's Spirit. And so Saul's response when he's confronted by Samuel is in verse 20. Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, yes, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag the king of Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. You know, that's about as contradictory as this statement by the children of Israel in Numbers 21. 
when they say there's no bread and as for this or and our soul loatheth this light bread. You know? It's like we hate the bread and, or we, there's no bread and we hate the bread. And that is one that just I just chuckle over that all the time. And then here for Saul, Saul says, you know, I destroyed all the Amalekites and I brought the I brought the number one Amalekite back. Did everything God wanted me to. You say, Pastor, that's nuts. It is. And that's how you and I are. That's how you and I are. You know, just about any time uh, something that God clearly doesn't want happens. It also happens that people are very much in their own wisdom out of fellowship with the Lord. Or in their own wisdom and out of fellowship with the Lord. For instance, has anyone here ever witnessed a church division or church split? And I'll tell you something. I mean, I've just heard sides to the stories. You ever heard both sides? And you listen to both of them, I mean, for the best of reasons. They're at odds with their brethren. If you're listening to this guy for best of reasons, he's at odds with his brother. And this guy, for the best of reasons, is at odds with his brother. And who's glorified in? God isn't. There's no humility in it. And the reality of it is, is that it's impossible for either one or even both of them to be spirit-filled in something that ultimately is evil and God hates. So Saul has an entire lack of humility here. He completely lacks humility, and because of it, he's irrational. Rebellious Christians look for reasons to disobey God. Rebellious Christians look for reasons to disobey God. I know I've, I've come into contact in my life with a lot of believers who don't like biblical authority. They just don't like authority at all. And one of their favorite things to do is to find something wrong with the authority so they can say something like, I have no respect for that person at all. Why do they want to have no respect for that person? Well, so they don't have to obey them. And it's, that's the way we are. And the fact of the matter is that this is Saul with God. Saul actually, now, you remember what happened when the people repented of making Saul king? When the people repented after God had given the victory and God had had a, a, a major storm come to show that he was angry and the people were, oh, we're in trouble now. And they repented and God said, now you get a king and I'm your king. And Samuel is the representative of God, of the theocracy. As a priest, he's a representative of God ruling in Israel. It's interesting that the person who is put in the place where God should have been as king doesn't want to come under God's authority. Samuel was Saul's authority, even though Saul was king, wasn't he? That was still the circumstance. you ever think of just about the authority structure here? Samuel was Saul's spiritual authority. And so this is Saul's rebellion. Not just against Samuel, ultimately against God. But this is God or Samuel or Saul saying to God, God, I am the highest authority. I don't, want to, I don't want Israel to be a theocracy. I want it to be a monarchy exclusively. Friend, when you get lifted up in pride, you're capable of the same thing. So am I. We're capable of this. I'm telling you, Saul's relatable. He's more relatable than we like to think that he is. And when you reject God's biblical authority, uh, and by the way, uh, did Samuel have, or did Saul have a reason to reject Samuel? Humanly speaking, the answer is yes. Remember Samuel's sons? That's why the Israelites, that was the excuse the Israelites made in order to come up with, we need a king. We know the answer to that as well, don't we? The answer to that is God can raise up another priest. He doesn't need Samuel's sons. If, if God could raise up a replacement for Levi, couldn't God raise up a replacement for Samuel? Sure he could. And so the argument is not honest, but we make dishonest arguments when we're in rebellion, and that is primarily, or that is exactly what's going on with Saul, is that it's ultimately rebellion. That's the diagnostic, or the diagnosis. Look at verse uh, 22. Samuel said, Hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, look, think, 
To obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Well, God's going to have to be impressed when he sees the idea that I had. And God isn't. You know, God just God is impressed by things that don't impress men. Always remember that. God's impressed by things that don't impress us. We're impressed with supernatural. God isn't. You think that God, when Elijah called down fire from heaven, said, whoa, look at Elijah. Do you think that God, when Peter, Jesus, when Peter began to walk on the water, was like, look at, look at Peter. God's never been impressed by the supernatural. We're impressed by the supernatural, but God isn't. The Scripture is very explicit about what impresses God, and what impresses God is obedience. Faith and obedience. God loves faith, and faith, of course, is evidenced by obedience. Obedience is the evidence of faith. And so Saul's a rebel. And that's, that's, the, that's the diagnostic. That's the diagnosis, I should say. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Well, that's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? You ever analyze and examine that? The irony of it is reading Saul's demise. Remember when Saul, when Saul's about to be defeated and he's about to die and he goes to the witch at Endor? What was her response when he said, you know, basically we were looking for a familiar spirit? Well, Saul's had them all killed, right? There's no familiar spirit. Saul's had them all killed. And yet Saul knew that they weren't all killed. And yet Saul went seeking one. See, Saul's a, Saul is a, a very, very subversive rebel. You know, a lot of times we think rebellion is outward. My friend, I've seen a lot of rebellion that's not outward. A lot of yes and then undermining. Oh, yes, I'll do it. But the, the, the yes is not a yes. Or the what I call pocket vetoing. You ever met somebody that doesn't argue? They just do what they want to do. They just, just ignore. They don't talk back. They don't say, I'm not doing it. They just do what they want to do and pretend like they didn't hear. And it's just rebellion. And God hearkens it to witchcraft. And the truth is, is that is exactly what it was. And Saul evidenced it later in his life. Oh, we're going to drive out all the familiar spirits in the land, except he didn't. Of course, he had outward, outward complicity, outward obedience. But inwardly, Saul wanted the witches in the land. You know, I think some of it probably Saul wasn't even fully aware of. You ever been, you ever realized that you have a little bit of something in you and it's more subliminal than, you know, overt? And his rebellion is not overt. It's covert. It's covered. Secret. Se I say secret? New word. Uh, secret. At time change Sunday makes things worse than usual. Uh, <laughs> so now, I want to look at Saul's response because that's what's really notable here. You know, what is the difference between Saul and David ultimately? Well, I suppose the kind of sin you could say is one of the differences. But will you agree with me that David was really pretty much a terrible person? And Saul's pretty much a terrible person? Humanly, just, just humanly speaking, sin being what it is. How many of you would want David for a father? How many of you would want David for a husband? How many of you would want Saul for a father? How many of you would want Saul for a husband? Pretty much they're just equals, aren't they? I mean, both of them lousy fathers, lousy husbands, terrible people. That, that's a fact. It's not me being judgmental. Those are just, they're supported in the Scripture. And if you... Uh, well, you men probably wouldn't want either of them for a husband, but you wouldn't like them for a wife either. So, uh, here, here we go. Here's Saul's response, and listen to it. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. By the way, words are important, but don't make too much of them. Because a lot of people know the right words. Remember a few years ago when people were being taught how to apologize? You know, you actually do need to know how to apologize, don't you? You know, I was wrong. And I'm asking your forgiveness. I, I, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done what I did. And, and part of apology is not excuses. I was wrong, and the only reason I did that is because, you know, if you hadn't said or whatever, 
No, you know, people don't know how to apologize, but Paul's apology is pretty good. Paul, I keep calling Paul. Saul. Saul. Saul said, I have sinned. I was wrong. I mean, he's pretty bold. First of all, he lies, right? I've done everything. I've obeyed the commandment of the Lord. And I utterly destroyed the Amalekites and kept Agag. And the people brought back the sheep. And the just lies and lies and he just piles on the lies. And now he's caught and he's in trouble. And God said, rebellion's as a sin of witchcraft. It's the same as worshiping the devil as far as God sees it. That's serious. And Saul says, oh, it's serious. I've sinned. Sorry. Literally. I mean, we look at it in the words. Criticize the words for me, will you? You phrase it the way Saul should have said it. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? But what's wrong is the qualification of it. You know, it's, in other words, it's a, I'm busted, and I sin, but then his subsequent response. This is what differentiates between David and Saul. He said, For I have transgressed the commandments of the Lord in thy words. Now, we don't read the rest of the verse, but you know, one of, the, one of the classic ways of apologizing is to acknowledge and to state what it is that you've done. You ever met the apologizer? I'm sorry if I'm sorry if you're mad. I'm sorry if you're offended. I'm sorry you feel that way. Yeah, all those things. I'm sorry if whatever. And you know, no, this is what I did, and I and I did it. And Saul says it. But then he goes on to blame. He goes to exonerate himself. You know, being king of a people is a pretty. A uh, pretty heavy weight of load of responsibility. Being leader, being a leader, you know, if you if you take leadership seriously and you realize the buck stops here, uh, I am ultimately the one that's responsible and answer to God. You ever read Hebrews thirteen carefully? Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves. What's the next phrase? For they watch for your souls, as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. You know, I've always taken that very seriously as a pastor. And realized you answer for you before God, and I answer for you, I answer for you before God as well. And that's pretty serious. You know, do no harm <laughs> is a pretty important mantra for leadership. Don't hurt, don't hurt someone spiritually. Because not only uh, do they answer to God for themselves, but you answer to God for them. That's dangerous. It's a dangerous situation, a serious matter. But Saul, instead of saying, you know what, the only reason these people brought back the sheep and the oxen is because I told them to. He said the only reason these people brought back the sheep and the oxen is because they did what they wanted to. <laughs> and he said, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now this might be somewhat true. It might be that Saul feared man more than he did God. The problem with that is that that isn't okay, is it? And so, his response now, Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. Now that sounds pretty good. Saul said, you know, now I've sinned. It was the people's fault, but I did. I did it. But do you think we know why Saul did it? Were the people complicit, Probably. I think they certainly were. The problem is, is that Saul was the one who was accountable. Saul's the one that God said, this is how you do it. And he's the one. He's the one, you remember, they hewed up his oxen. Is Saul, is Saul afraid of the people now? Well, he oughtn't to be. They're, they ought to be afraid of him. They ought to be afraid to do wrong. He chopped up his oxen and sent them out and said, hey, you better, you better follow me. They'll say, well, he cut up his oxen. He might cut me up. I better follow him. And now the same guy is saying, well, you know what, I wouldn't have done it with the people, you know, I just, you know, it's so much pressure and I was afraid of them. But I wasn't afraid of God. Now pardon me and, uh, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And he said, you know, you know, Samuel, make it okay with God. Fix it. The same as sin as Saul, I will not return with thee. For thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee for being king over Israel. Oh. See, first... 
Saul was rejected from his seed being established. But now Saul's rejected from being king. And Saul's response is simply, you know what, just you know, turn and pray. And, and then you'd think that that statement would get his attention. You know, I've seen individuals that I believe evidence real repentance. I'm not the judge of people's repentance. God is, but God does know. And I've, said, I've seen people say, you know, I don't care what happens. You know, the worst thing in the world is that I've destroyed my fellowship with God. And it's the most terrible place in the world to be, and all I want is my relationship with God. Mm -hmm. I'm disqualified from what I did, whatever, where I was, and I'm not asking for God to give me anything back, but uh, I'm grieved that I have harmed my relationship with God. Saul said that, but then in verse 27, Samuel said, God's rejected you from being king. And he turns around, as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid a hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. What do we see here? At least I've seen the play, you know, where Saul falls down sobbing and grabs a hold of Samuel's mantle and he cries. Well, I don't think the Scripture is saying that. I think Saul is saying, you get back here. He grabs the skirt of his mantle and tries to rip him back. Like, you get back here and you, you, you return with me. So that's what he said to Samuel, return with me so we can worship the Lord. Samuel turns around to walk away and Saul says, you're not going anywhere, pal. And he goes to grab him and rips the skirt of his mantle. Saul isn't sorry. He said, he said what he thought would manipulate Samuel. But the problem with manipulating, manipulating, manipulating Samuel is that God's telling Samuel what to say and what to do, and Samuel's listening to God, not Saul. You know, if you're dealing in a disciplined situation, if you're any kind of authority, you need to learn how to do that. Because the fact of the matter is that people can deceive us, any of us. I can be deceived very easily. I can be deceived by good works, and I can be deceived by what I perceive not to be good works many times. You know, a lot of Christians are so worried about determining whether or not someone's saved or lost based on their works. You know, if somebody's trying to fool me, they just figure out what I'm looking for and do it. There are many rebels who comply so that they can control or manipulate you. And that's Saul. Saul said, Samuel, you know, put on a face. Come back with me. Let's worship you know, and Samuel turns around to leave and Saul says, you're not leaving. We see a different perspective. We see a different Saul. Samuel's mantle rents, it rips, it tears, and he's not afraid. Samuel's not afraid of this seven foot tall guy or how big Saul was. Samuel said unto him, the Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that's better than thou. And he said, and Saul, God's done with it. And this is what ought to frighten us. Verse 29, Also the strength of Israel will not lie or nor repent. For he's not a man that he should repent. So God's not going to change his mind about this, Saul. God has given your kingdom to another person who's better than you, and God's not going to change his mind. It's done. It's final, finito, finished. Now here's the question. Were Saul truly repentant? Because in verse 30 he said, I have sinned. I have sinned. Yet now honor me before the elders. Again, he tries to manipulate some more. So now Saul's response is, I've done wrong, now honor me in front of the elders. What would be the correct response when God says, God has rent your kingdom from you and given it to a neighbor that's better than you? Amen. Bring him out here. Bring him, bring him over here and we'll transfer We'll just go ahead and transfer leadership in front of everybody so people will know what God wants. Jonathan would have done that. I love that about Jonathan. Jonathan, I know God's given you the kingdom. He said to David, I know God's chosen you. You're God's chosen, no question about it. That's what Saul should have done. Saul should have just got in line with God's plan. Could God have used that Saul? Well, Absolutely. But Saul wasn't willing to let God use... So Saul said, well, just pretend. Pretend that isn't so, Samuel. <laughs> Honor me now before the men of Israel. 
In other words, make them think I'm a legitimate king. And here we find that in Saul's rebellion, he's willing to look legitimate even though he's not. He's willing to be an imposter. <clears throat> and so the guy that doesn't even desire the kingdom has been mightily used of God. Instead of giving God the glory, he's allowed, he's allowed his exploits, his feats, to go to his head. And the consequence now is that he's not even interested in getting right with God. Now, I've heard people that play the game of trying to say Saul was lost because of different reasons and so forth, but my friend, I don't believe that at all. I think Saul will probably be in heaven. I've, you know, I remember being in Life of David class and hearing people argue that, you know, that Saul was a lost man. I don't believe so. I think he's, I think he's a man that's probably going to be in heaven someday. But he surely did mar his relationship with God. Certainly did have a bad relationship with God. I'm not interested in, uh, you know, debating that with you. We can discuss it certainly, but the reality of it is that Saul was once mightily used of God, and he changed. And uh, so what was Samuel's response? So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Then what happened? It's all good, right? In other words, Saul was just fine with having that. As long as everything looked okay, that was good enough for him. Before we finish up this evening, let's do business. Let's, let's think a little bit, shall we? Ecclesiastes 5 says, When thou vowest a vow to God, defer not to pay it. You know, the scripture talks about that. It talks about keep thy foot when thou goest in the house of God. and uh, you know, Don't be hasty. Let thy mouth utter anything. Why? Well, because you don't want to be a fool and promise something that you either don't deliver or you can't deliver. And then the Bible says if you promise God something, keep it. You know, believers are notorious for promising God. Dedication. Probably more, I should probably challenge our young people to dedicate themselves to full-time service more. But you know, I, I, I'm concerned about people promising God something they won't do. You know, there are a lot of Christians who are just willing to look like they do something great for God and they think it's the same as if they'd just given Him all their life because they said they would. What you do is more important than what you say you'll do. You know, I think there are a lot of Christians who are content to look as though they're in fellowship with God. But I remind you that God knows everything and it's the things that Others don't know that you and God know. And we have to be careful about being content to not have anything public, publicly wrong. Anything anyone knows about, as long as nobody knows about it, it's okay. That was Saul's position. You know something, if you're not in fellowship with the Lord, you know it and God knows it and it isn't okay. As a matter of fact, it's rebellion. It's what it comes down to. You hear me? If you're not in fellowship with the Lord, you know it, God knows it, and it's not okay. And it's rebellion, because that's exactly what Saul's issue was. Saul was willing to be out of fellowship with God as long as it looked as though he was fine. You know, there are churches that are just full of people who are willing to live. They, they love a church that has low standards for living for Jesus. Why? Well, because if everybody's okay with this, then I must be okay. And you know what they are? The church is full of people who are content to be out of fellowship with the Lord, and they don't care as long as people think they're okay. What's the spiritual state of Israel at this time? Well, the people were complicit, weren't they? Isn't Jeremiah where the Scripture rebukes the pastors? That is the kings who have made the people to sin. In Israel, the repentance has always, uh, always followed leadership normally. There's always, you know, the few, the fragment that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal and so forth. But the truth is when they were 
following the Lord. And when they put away idols, it was when a king did it. When a king destroyed the high places, when a king put away idols. The people were just the same as Saul was. That's tragic, isn't it? Because it all started from them saying, we want a king instead of Samuel. And Saul was pretty good... Uh, he was a pretty good representative of the attitude of the people. I'm reminded in our country, especially because we do have a representative form of government, I'm reminded that our leadership is oftentimes a good barometer of where we're at. <coughs> Some years ago, Christians were just in a tizzy over Barack Obama. And you know, the tragedy of Barack Obama was what he represented, not what he was. The same is true for any leader that doesn't fear God. The tragedy of them is what they represent more so than what they are. If you're a leader, you're the one that's supposed to say, hey, there's something wrong here, and we need to lead back in this direction. We need to go this direction. We need to take it seriously. We need to look at our lives. We need to go back and say, you know what? God, show me the soul. Show me the Saul attitude that I have. Where it's like, as long as I don't get caught, I'm not going to repent. I'm not going to turn. or I'm not going to deal with my sin. As long as I'm not exposed. And that was what Saul was concerned about. You know, don't, don't make me look bad in front of the people, Samuel. As long as I don't look bad in front of the people, it's okay if I've been rejected from being king, even if I'm an imposter as a king. And the rest of Saul's days, he lived as an imposter trying to hold on to a throne that God said wasn't His. What a tragedy that is. When you see the change from a man who had the humility to say, I don't know if I want to be king, and he hid in the baskets, hid in the stuff, to being a man who said, as long as I look like king, it doesn't really matter if I am or not. And so Saul's life's a tragedy. But your life can be a tragedy too. Here's the beauty of it. When you're living and you're breathing, you're like Solomon described in Ecclesiastes. A live dog is better than a dead lion. You may be a dog, but if you're alive, you can still change. You can repent. When you're dead, that's it. You, are you breathing? you living tonight? There, there's a certain point, there's a, there's a certain time when God says, you know what, that's enough from you. But you're not there yet. And so here's our warning from the Word of God. So Father, thank you for the warning. And God, each of us needs to heed it. Every one of us. And every one of us needs to be reminded of what we're capable of. That people can change, change for bad. God, help <clears throat> us not to do that. Help us to be faithful to you. Uh, show us what we are. And God, just show us what rebellion is in us. Help us to see Saul in us when we're unwilling to truly repent. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ye are dismissed. Preacher, I got a question. Okay. What, what is, uh, why was Saul...